colada no... Nešto mi se prekinulo sa kojom je bilo lagano sve dogovoriti i evo danas smo, kažem, ovde zajedno. Ono što smo i dogovorili sa Judith jeste da ćemo u ova dva sata koje imamo zajednička Judith predstaviti ovo što je osmislila vezano za svoje za njenu novu knjigu, posle toga kad bude, posle njenog, ajde tako kažem, izlaganja, ako postoje pitanja, slede pitanja i odgovori. Draga Judith, je li to ono što za početak je, treba da se kaže, da bi krenula da govoriš? E sad, da li me, ja ne čujem nikoga, ne znam šta se dešava. Let me know when I'm supposed to start. Evo, možemo da krenemo. Da. We can, yeah. But just a note, if someone is speaking in Serbian or Croatian, you can use interpretation button and switch to English channel, so you will hear the translation. Oh, um, I I don't know how to do that. Um, it's uh, it's on the bottom on the Zoom if you see it. The bottom. I I don't see that. Um. My own nature, mother. Oh, interpretation here. Yeah. Did you find it? I tried to explain. It's like on the bottom, on the bottom of, of the screen. Interpretation, like a globe. Do you see it? Now I am see it, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So it would be better, yeah, of course, if you can hear all of us. Thanks. Okay, so sh uh, uh, should I start? Yes, you can start. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I will give a little background to the topic that I'm going to talk about today. I've, I've worked for um, most of my career as a psychiatrist uh, in uh, a program in a, a, a hospital-based program called the Victims of Violence Program. And um, this was basically a, a treatment program that we started for crime victims. We, most of the people we saw were uh, survivors of, of childhood abuse, sexual assault, sexual trafficking, uh, sexual harassment and domestic violence. Um, and we also saw political refugees, people who were seeking asylum because of political persecution. And what we found was that Trauma is trauma, uh, and that the, the picture of post-traumatic stress that we saw for people who had survived political violence was not that not very different from what we saw um, uh, for survivors of violence in the so-called private sphere of family and intimate and sexual life. Um, and so 30 years ago, I wrote a book called Trauma and Recovery that basically said trauma originates in, in the, the kind of trauma we see originates in interpersonal violence. It 
it originates in, in crime and in injustice. I mean, we did see there are people who have post-traumatic stress from an auto accident or uh, something where human cruelty was not involved, but they, they get better by themselves. They don't come to us. Uh, the, the really lasting, enduring traumatic syndromes result from an, an up close uh, experience of human cruelty. Um, and so, and I, I wrote about the stages of recovery. I named three stages of recovery, starting with establishing safety and then uh, grieving and uh, the trauma to going back and from a position of safety to say that was a to, to grieve and, and tell the trauma story. And then finally to kind of reconnect with the present and the future in a more proactive way. Um, and uh, the more, it, uh, so this is really a, a sequel to that book. Uh, but I began to imagine a fourth stage and that would be the stage of, of justice. Because if indeed trauma originates in a crime in, and in injustice, then, uh, then complete healing must require some form of justice. And, and so I went back to interview the kinds of people I had worked with over the years, survivors of gender violence. And I interviewed 26 women and four men uh, from very diverse backgrounds in terms of social class, uh, uh, geographic uh, origin, uh, religion, uh, uh, ethnicity or race. Uh, and I asked them if you, if you could have your way, if you could write the script, what would make things right for you? Over the half of them had uh, actually sought justice either in criminal or civil court, that's a much higher percentage than uh, uh, most survivors of gender violence don't go anywhere near the police or the courts uh, uh, because they, they know how they're gonna be treated basically. Um, uh, and uh, so in that way, it's not a representative sample, but it's a sample of people that uh, had, for many of whom had firsthand experience with what our justice system actually provides. Um, and uh, I, I chose survivors of gender violence because that's what I know best, but I would argue that the same concepts could uh, apply to any situation where the dominance of one group over another is deeply ingrained in the culture, whether that's based on race, religion, gender, uh, and so on, and, and so on. So here's what, uh, we, I, I came up with. Uh, basically, the, the conceptual uh, frame of the book 
describes two different kinds of human relationship, uh, one based on dominance and subordination, which I call tyranny, and one based on cooperation. Um, and, and these rules can be found in every part of the world and in every category of human relationship from the most intimate realms of family and, and sex to the realm of the nation state and to the international realms of religion, crime, and business. So the rules of tyranny, the strong do as they please, the weak submit, and the bystanders look the other way, either because they feel helpful, helpless, because they're intimidated and they don't want to get involved, they don't care, or they actually um, and, uh, are complicit with the abusers. And under such uh, under, under such circumstances, there's no such thing as justice. There may be courts, there may be laws, but those are just instruments of the powerful. And so, uh, so victims have no recourse. Um, gender violence, the other reason I chose gender violence as uh, uh, is, is because uh, patriarchy is the patriarchat koji predstavlja najstariji i najprostranjeniji oblik tiranije na svetu a dominacija jedne grupe nad drugom se uvek zasniva na tome da se vrši nasilje nasilje nad ženama je ispada najveće gaženje ljudskih prava u celom svetu. Tako da imamo specijalne izvesti u cijeve Ujedinjenih nacija za ljudska prava. Here is a report from 20 years ago basically talking about how violence against women and children is a crime of impunity. It was true 20 years ago, it's still basically true. In the United States, uh, uh, our criminal justice uh, system considers rape a felony, a serious crime. Kao But, na ozbiljan zločin, na ozbiljno krivično delo, ali u praksi preko 90 procenata počinilaca se izvuče nekažnjeno. I evo zašto. Ovo su podaci iz 1990-ih, ali ja sam ažurilala dakle, ovaj... Maximum estimates for what percentage of rape victims report a crime to the police, somewhere between 25 and 30%. I think that's actually a high estimate. Um, and then what you see here is an exponential decay curve. Uh, only about half of the cases result in arrest, even though most rapes are committed by people whom the victim knows. Um, and then by the time the case is accepted for prosecution, and results in the conviction and the prison term, which is our measure of sort of successful operation of the criminal justice system, you're down under 5%, um, and probably more like zero to 1%. And I don't have similar data from European countries, but I would be very surprised if they were very different. Here are the rules for relationships of mutuality. 
Um, and again, those the, that can range from relationships of parents and children to uh, you know cooperative relationships on an international scale. Um, everyone deserves respect. Everyone deserves a voice. Uh, decisions are made by negotiation rather than force. Um, and that means everyone shares power, but also responsibility. Uh, of course, it's not an equal relationship between parents and children, but that doesn't mean that, you know, children don't get a say, get a say, and that parents don't listen. And um, children gradually grow into taking responsibility for their own behavior. In if when these relationships are, when these principles are observed, children grow up healthy. They form safe attachments. They learn both to respect themselves and respect others. Uh, and they understand the principle of fairness and which I, I read a, a lot of sort of uh, justice philosophy for this book. And, Basically, it comes down to fairness, which is an idea that most children understand. Um, when, um, when rules of mutuality are observed, people develop the develop trust that uh, everybody will be will follow the rules and if the, if someone doesn't follow the rules then the community is expected to rally to protect the victim and hold the perpetrator accountable and this um this idea of a moral community is very foundational to the idea of of justice. Um, this is a quote from a man named Ross London, uh, who during his career served both as a prosecutor, then as a defense attorney, and finally as a judge, a municipal judge. And he wrote a book talking about uh, the ways that uh, that an injury to one has to be thought of as an injury to all. Otherwise, the victim, <laughs> excuse me, um, feels <laughs> isolated and ostracized. Uh, and and this is what and, and so it's the it's it's what the bystanders do. Uh, when a crime has been committed that really matters most to the victim. And this is what I heard in the testimony of so many of the people who, uh, who I, whom I interviewed. Here's someone who was a, an incest survivor who felt betrayed by her family because when she disclosed, they basically wanted to just hush it up. They didn't want to know about it. They, you know, they, she was basically just, uh, why was she disturbing the happy family? And so basically they took the side of the perpetrator. And that's also true when the justice system doesn't come to the support of the victim. Here, um, this is a quote from a rape survivor. Uh, she was raped at a party. She knew perfectly well who the abuser was. She went, she's one of the few who went to the police and um, uh, I, you know, told her story. But um, in our justice system, it's not the victim who it gets to file criminal charges. That 
is the prerogative of the state. Um, I mean, in, in a positive sense, that is one way of saying the state considers an injury to an individual, also an injury to the state. But because the DA had discretion, the, the prosecutor, she and this was an acquaintance rape at a party. She, you know, uh, she didn't want to press, go ahead with uh, 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 trying the case because um, he, you, you know, it would be he said, she said the 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 uh, abuser would say, oh, she consented, she was drinking, and uh, and it would be her word against his, and uh, you know how that goes. So, but she felt that that betrayal hurt more than the rape. And here's a, another quote from a survivor of domestic violence. She basically said, uh, even though you know much more about the situation than anybody else, you're just a witness. And, uh, and uh, they, they, Inyoy, yeah. Vi ste tu samo nekakav šraf u toj mašineriji i ona je rekla odbacite te iluzije o pravdi i odustanite od pravde. That would be guaranteed to make the symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder worse, a court of law would probably be a very good fit because, whoops, come back. What victims need and what the justice system requires of them are often diametrically opposed. So victims need safety, first of all, and going to court increases the risk. She can be th threatened by the perpetrator, by his friends, by his family, um, and there's really not much protection offered. Um, victims need acknowledgement, but they're credible, and they need to be treated with respect and dignity, but courts are adversarial, uh, the court proceedings are adversarial, and so they're going to have their credibility challenged. They're going to be um, bullied and humiliated, basically. Uh, victims need to have some control over their lives, but you don't have any control of your life when you're involved in, in le legal proceedings because the court sets the timetable uh, and uh, basically provides a place to be re-traumatized um, instead of uh, limiting your exposure to trauma reminders you have a confronta actual confrontation with the perpetrator and I still think that more survivors would be willing to go through all that if the outcome what the court delivered was what they won't really wanted most, but it's not for most people. But what most of my informants wanted most was to for the community to rally and stop this guy from doing it again. And the ones who went through with the, the whole process often said things like, you know, I, I couldn't live with myself if I found out that he did it again to somebody else because I was too scared. Um, but the outcome is punishment and 
as we'll see, that's not what most people really wanted the most. Or for civil trials, the outcome is monetary damages. And again, money wasn't the main thing that people wanted. Here's what people wanted most. The, the three uh, items in red are the thing are the things that people were in unanimous agreement about. They wanted acknowledgement, first of all, um, not just the facts, but also the harm that was done. And they wanted the acknowledgement, not mainly by the perpetrator, but by the community, the bystanders. And they wanted the community to denounce the crime, to say, this was wrong. This shouldn't, this, this hurt you and you didn't deserve that. And um, no matter what you were wearing or how many drinks you had. Uh, uh, and they wanted the shame lifted from their shoulders and placed on the shoulders of the perpetrator where it belonged. So these were the things everyone agreed on. They were very mixed about wanting apologies. A lot of people didn't think, of, some people really did want an apology. Others thought there was, you know, there wasn't gonna be, so, uh, an apology wouldn't be sincere. And that would just add insult to injury. Some people really wanted money damages, others, felt like that was dirty money. They didn't want to touch any money from the trader. They mainly wanted prevention of future harm by exposing and containing the offender, doing whatever was necessary to stop it from happening again. They weren't very big on punishment. They weren't very big on revenge. I asked specifically about revenge because, you know, the stereotype is that um, victims will be so vengeful. Um, and they weren't also, they were also not very big on forgiveness. Um, so let me just illustrate that with a few quotes. Here's a survivor of domestic violence who basically said, it, said it very simply, I just wanted people to know this is what he did to another human being. That's who he is. Um, here's another uh, survivor who also felt she had to, first of all, assert her humanity. I'm a living, breathing human being. I'm not just a body. Um, and then they would, they, she wanted the, uh, the sex buyers. This was someone who, whose father had both sexually abused her and then pimped her. Uh, soldier, basically. Um, and uh, when basically she was, uh, she was maybe nine, 10, 11, 12 uh, years old. So the, the sex buyers knew perfectly well that she was underage and she was also drugged, obviously drugged. Um, but she said, um, she didn't see any point in locking them up, but she said, I want their families to know what they did. They would have to write a letter to their families and tell the truth. So then she wanted them exposed. Here's a man who um, had been sexually abused uh, as a child by the director of a boys chorus that he was part of. Um, and uh, he's someone who had dissociative amnesia and delayed recall. Um, by the time he recalled what happened as an adult, the statute of limitations had run for criminal charges, even though he was able to identify many other people who had been also been abused by this same man. Um, but he, uh, so he sued for damages in civil court and the offender basically left the state 
So, uh, oh, and by the way, started another boys course in another state. Um, so talk about impunity. Um, but uh, the judge ruled in his favor and he, he said the damages would amount to half a million dollars. Now, there was no way he was ever gonna see a, a penny of that money, but that's not what mattered to him was. He said, money, you know, it, it, made, it, it meant that the judge thought that this was important and he felt vindicated. Um, uh, being vindicated doesn't, it was not at all the same as feeling revenged. Um, many survivors did have revenge fantasies, but many of them were very troubled by their revenge fantasies. They said, if this is not me, you know, it felt like a, a toxic residue of the hatred that they had seen in the eyes of the abuser. This is a, an artist named Amy Bradford who uh, did a, a painting about her revenge fantasies. Um, so here she is, the rape survivor shooting her abuser. Um, but then here she is crying um, over all, in the background are all the victims of gun violence in the state of Massachusetts the year that this happened. And she, she um, you know, in her nightmares, she, you know, wanted this guy tortured. And then when she woke up, she was disgusted with her own dreams. So people were not, were very conflicted about revenge. Interestingly, and I found this to be true um, often, the family members of the, or the, the intimate partners of the victims were much less conflicted about their revenge fantasies. So here's Amy's husband, Bill, and he, um, he said, you know, not only that this guy is not a human being, he's a thing, but he wished he'd already killed him. Uh, and then, so then I asked him, well, but what if he apologized to her and really meant it? And he, he was, you know, he kind of did a jump. He, you could see the light bulb go off in his head. He said, whoops, come back. Um, I know it'll never happen, but if he really sincerely apologized to her and to me, I'm, I think that would help. I'm tired of being angry, he said. And then he said, I'm surprised to hear myself say that. And there is that kind of um, spontaneity in response to a true apology that is, real, is kind of magical. Um, uh, one survivor said she just, she felt lifted um, when her father, um, many years later, apologized for abusing her. And she could tell it was a, seer, a sincere apology because he was sobbing. And she said he wasn't feeling sorry for himself. He was genuinely remorseful for what he did. Um, but insincere apologies just felt like that would be even more hurtful. And so nobody wanted the politician apology. You know, mistakes were made in the, you know, always the passive voice, not I did something, but, you know, we regret if anyone was offended, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and here's another incest survivor. She, she'd been abused by her older brother. 
And she think she having known him all that time, she said he wouldn't feel sorry, really sorry. He actually, you know, he would enjoy talking about what he did. It would be pornographic. Um, and then she would feel family pressure to forgive, and she really didn't want to go there. Um, and that was what, what I heard from many of my um, informants, including people who were very devout Christians. Um, Mary Margaret Janini, who was a rape survivor, um, was a minister's daughter and had a very active um, religious practice of her own. But she said, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be, she, she did not want any kind of face to face um, uh, reconciliation. She said, he doesn't need my forgiveness. He needs his creator's forgiveness. Um, and uh, another informant who was a, um, a Protestant minister said that she thought she had uh, developed what she called an interfaith partnership against domestic violence, um, trying to advise clergy about how to handle uh, instances of domestic violence that came to their attention, um, and not just to advise the women to submit and, you know, for the to keep the family together, um, that this was their cross to bear. Um, as one, she said, one of her parishioners said to her, I turn the other cheek and turn the other cheek and now I have no face left. Um, so she said, rather than, it's, it's too convenient, it's too easy to push victims to forgive. We need to be thinking about how to, get perpetrators to be remorseful and change their behavior. And of course, because we don't know how to do that because we've never invested very seriously in even, I mean, we studying perpetrators, let alone figuring out how to change their behavior. Um, you know, punishment has been our default response. Here's the survivor who did feel that it would be good to get some money damages. Um, she, um, because she had spent so much money on healthcare and mental health care. Um, so she, she said, but she didn't want to get the money from the abusers that just felt tainted. Um, but she said, I, uh, uh, if, if the community would require uh, the abusers to pay into a, a fund that, you know, take money out of their paychecks like taxes, um, that would feel much better. And in fact, in the United States, we do have a model for that. Um, that I think is very progressive and, and I recommend. Uh, and that is that there is a crime victims fund that comes from fines on convicted offenders. And the money goes into a fund that supports, first of all, compensation for individual victims for both medical bills and time lost from work. Um, it also pays for victim advocates in the courts to make the courts a little less intimidating to victims. And it pays for victim crisis services like 
battered women's shelters and rape crisis centers. Um, so um, up until now, the, um, the funds have always come just from fines on offenders, not from taxpayers, but there's an argument to be made that we as bystanders should also be contributing to that fund. Um, so here's a quote from the late British philosopher, Bernard Williams. He talks about how when the community shares the victim's outrage, the victim's helpless rage can be transformed into righteous indignation. And righteous indignation, when it's shared, binds people together in a sense of community. And that, that sense of shared indignation, shared respect for their honor was really, I think, what the survivors I interviewed wanted most. They didn't, they didn't really know what should be done with the offenders. I mean, there were six out of the uh, 30 who had actually gone through the whole criminal justice process to a conviction and a prison term for the offender. That's 20%, that's way higher than, you know, uh, than what the justice system actually delivers on average. Um, but they said, they, they agreed, some of them didn't even believe in that, I mean, some of them were kind of on principle, didn't believe in prisons, but they felt that, that they, these particular people belonged in prison because it was, uh, they, they were, multi, you know, they were repeat offenders. They had a very well-developed modus operandi and they were gonna do it again. And they did so that they felt they had to be isolated from the community because they didn't know any other way to provide community safety. But, but they wanted the community to figure out how to provide community safety much in a much more proactive way than, had, than the community does. So, uh, so let me close with, this is a poster uh, from, uh, now that we have this National Center for Victims of Crime in our uh, United States Justice Department. Um, we even have a Crime Victims' Rights Week every year. And uh, our, our program, the Victims of Violence Program used to, uh, there'd be a conference uh, at our state legislature um, every every year during Victim Rights Week, and we would always participate in that conference. And um, so here's a poster from one of those Victim Rights Week conferences. And as you see, the central um, idea is bringing honor to victims. Um, and then here are all the things that the victims really want, voice, choices, resources, information, participation, advocacy, counseling, restitution, safety, support, justice, um, respect. Um, and so let me close with that and the floor is open for comments or questions?
Ali ja predlažem ko ima pitanja. Now I propose if anyone has a question please just unmute yourselves and ask directly. You don't need to use the chat box to write. You can just raise your hand or unmute. Oh, do we need just some time to reflect and sort out all the impressions and information or is it something else? Would you like to take a five minute break and just have a little time to think about questions? But well, I think that's a good idea, yeah. Five minutes break, Very good. just to sort out all the impressions and uh, okay. yeah, yeah. thoughts. People can talk to you, talk to your neighbor. Um, oh, except you're all on Zoom, of course. So, um, yeah, yes. Think about whether there are other things you'd like me to talk more about. Ja hey, ću onda zaustaviti snimanje, napravit ću pauzu samo. Vaš. One section of family and family uh, department within psychiatric um, hospital in, in Serbia. And uh, at the time, I think we were not trained to recognize uh, domestic violence from the perspective of power and control. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... Um, uh, judging uh, women mostly in the case of, of divorces that we did the custody, custody uh, 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 procedures. Uh, and and your book was with me since uh, since then. So it was fantastic to have to have opportunity to to see you and hear you in this format live. Um, later on, in 2004, I started working with the Autonomous Women's Center, training um, many representatives of institutions in our country oh. and designing programs uh, for prevention and, uh, uh, and uh, termination, if I could say in English, of domestic violence, specifically gender-based violence. And I worked quite a lot cross borders with the victims of... Um, uh, females uh, victimized during the the war um and uh, what what uh, what i was facing is that trauma never stops unless it's recognized widely uh in different forms either through court uh, processes uh, or by uh, by the offenders who would um, take the responsibility and uh, sometimes apologize, but at least uh, acknowledge what they did. So it it uh, it works within the psyche as long as some part of the system is denying it, and that's why this book is so brilliant. I think continuation of of, of your work. Thank you for it. Um, what is my trouble is that um, uh, two two aspects of, of this. One is maybe you can give us some insight or or some advice how to how to change the um, attitudes and values uh, within uh, representatives of the state institutions because I found that extremely difficult. And uh, it's mostly based in value systems, what people see when they, uh, when they do their job in protecting the, the victims, especially among female representatives in social welfare system of Serbia, mostly 
uh, female uh, professionals are employed and that's on first glance paradoxical, but they are somehow holding the patriarchal values even sometimes stronger than male representatives, but there are not many except in in uh, in uh, prosecution prosecutors' offices, but in in social welfare system, those are mostly women. So mm-hmm. how we influence uh, in in which way? Because we tried with with uh, education and training, but it doesn't really move as fast as we wanted at all. And secondly, uh, what do we do as helpers? Because I think what was my struggle is. Uh, uh, not only being secondary traumatized, but uh, being constantly helpless. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember we, I'll just share this, uh, that I read one uh, verdict in, in our uh, 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 justice system, it still used the phrase in the name of, of the people. That's mm-hmm. how any verdict starts. Yeah. But this yeah. is for a girl whose father was found guilty in the court. And I remember when I read this in the name of the people, that sounds quite communistic in my mind, but in that moment, I felt tears in my eyes because I felt so grateful for that sentence that the, that we all recognize what happened to this uh, uh, adolescent in her family. Uh, so I, I can feel how important is that aspect. So how we help ourselves not to 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 be overwhelmed with helplessness that our victims, our uh, clients that our victims are experiencing and how do we address the patriarchal values with professionals that we try to educate, train or collaborate with? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are great questions, thanks. Um, Well, let me talk first about taking care of ourselves because um, I mean, the advice I give to everyone who goes into this kind of work is never do it alone. Because um, if, uh, I mean, I think secondary traumatic stress doesn't, uh, these are kind of bland terms for what it feels like to confront the horrors that human beings are capable of. You know, I mean, it's just, um, the, you know, words fail, you know, and, and so if you don't have a good support system, you're, you're gonna burn out, you know, you're gonna give in to despair. Um, uh and so i mean the the reason i was able to carry on for so many years was the i felt like my colleagues at um at the victims of violence Pro- program may, many of whom became good friends you know exemplified the best of what humans are capable of. They were caring, they were dedicated, they were smart, they were um, creative. Um, and we didn't just, you know, I mean, but you have to you have to have a shoulder to cry on because you think you've heard everything, but you haven't. There's always some some survivors going to tell you a story that you just couldn't in your wildest imagination think somebody, you know, and and so you need that support and you also need, you know, you need the, um, the, the things that, that make life, you know, that give you a sense of why life is worth living. So not just the relationships and the connections, but you know, we used to sing together, or, you know, we used to, um, uh, uh, we put on plays. I mean, we, uh, we had parties, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> um, we went swimming, you know, and, um, 
because uh, you, you need to be able to celebrate the good things that uh, in life. And so, so never do it alone and, and, you know, make sure you really do have a good support system. I mean, that's why organizations like these, I think like, like yours are so important. Um, my mother, who was a psychologist, um, used to say that activism is the antidote to despair. And I think when it comes to changing social attitudes of your, it, of your fellow professionals or in general, it's a huge organizing task. Um, and, you know, and it does really, I mean, I think having it led by survivors speaking out, uh, it can be very powerful. Um, and, you know, that's why the Me Too movement was so powerful in the United States, um, actually started by black community organizers um, who saw the kind of exploitation going on in their own community um, and then got picked up by these Hollywood stars and, you know, uh, became much more uh, 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 came to much more general notice, but um, uh, I mean, I think it starts with holding a few notorious perpetrators accountable, um, you know, the pillars of the community, the big shots. Um, but but, and then it involves, I think, a lot of organizing work that we don't generally think about in terms of cross professions. Um, for example, um, one of the things we did at the Victims of Odds program, besides, you know, we had a, a clinical service program and, and teaching for professionals, you know, professional training. Um, and research and so on. But we also, at one point, we did a lot of education work with police because the police attitudes were, you know, very victim blaming. Um, and, um, and we had to, um, you know, just giving them a training where they sort of check the box, trauma informed, you know, doesn't do it. But we had to do things like talk about their own, like about how post-traumatic stress disorder affects police. Um, and of course they didn't want to hear any, they didn't want to admit to anything that might show weakness on their part, you know, because it's such a, a macho, culture. So we, we, we did some trainings about general health, not mental health. Um, and we uh, invited their wives to come. And we put together a book of recipes for healthy eating, because cops tended to you know, eat donuts and, uh, you know, and, and uh, sugar, salt, and fat, you know, and, um, and are very prone to things like heart attacks and um, high, uh, high blood pressure. And so we, you, you know, it was a, a different kind of organizing. It wasn't just telling them what they should think. It was enlisting their wives to try to get them to think about their own self-care and the ways that, that, you know, how they, how much they hate to go out on domestic violence calls, you know, um, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I've seen, I, I, I looked around when I was writing the book, um, 
to see other instances where something a, you know, creative had happened within a certain court or um, legal uh, legal service and so on. And it all involved getting people out of their own um, usual ha habits to talk to people who were dealing with this problem from a different angle, you know? So the, the you know, we had a, a, a wonderful judge who, you know, had been sentencing women to jail for prostitution for years. And he finally realized most of them were teenagers. You know, I mean, the average age of recruitment is about, well, 13. Um, and he, so he borrowed some social workers from a judge, drug court and he, he sentenced them to um, basically uh, 30 days in a shelter for girls in the life. Uh, and, uh, and he began to, and, and, and his fellow, you know, the police and the prosecutors and his fellow judges all laughed at him because they thought he was, these were just bad girls, you know? And um, he was making a fool of himself, but now that model is being replicated in other courts. Um, so um, that kind of organizing, I think, can really help. But it's hard work. Thank you. It is. Thank you very much. Hand up over here, Shanaz. Hi, um, I typed you a message, but I'm just going to tell it to you because it is quite wordy. Um, so my name is Shanaz, and I'm from South Africa, but I'm studying at the, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh -huh. um, and I'm interested to know more about the requirements of justice, um, oh. as you stated earlier. Can you call, hang on one second? Someone's at the door. Okay. I don't know why. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, so you stated earlier that the population wasn't like generalizable, universal, um, but I'm doing work with young women and girls in South Africa who've been exposed to gender-based violence. Um, and they are often never get any acknowledgement or vindication or apologies or forgiveness or anything of that kind right. because the perpetrators are often protected by the family secrecy or cultural beliefs um, or traditions that really promote um, men and kind of this idea of the hierarchical role and really kind of create shame and fear. Um, do you think they can get justice? And how would that work when the system kind of works against them? Well, I think the first, um, the, the first step is really kind of trying to create an alternative community. Um, one of the, because as you say, the, the customs and traditions of the community they live in uh, are basically silence and blame the victims. Um, so one of the things we used to do a lot at the Victims of Violence program was we ran short-term groups for survivors. Um, and we had different group models for different stages of recovery. Um, in, the, in, the, in the very early stages of recovery, um, we had a, a 10 week, and we actually uh, published a couple of 
practice guides for how to run these groups. Um, but they're very, and one of the nice things about them is that they're very adaptable. So, that, you know, people can take what they like and sort of adapt the model to their particular populations. Um, uh, but there was a 10 week, you know, once a week for an hour, 10 week support group. And it was very educational. We had a topic for each session um, uh, with a little worksheet, a little, you know, for each session. And if people could read, we, we, they took turns reading a paragraph and then people would discuss. If we weren't sure everybody in the group could read, then the group leaders would read. By the way, we always had co-leadership for our groups because again, you don't wanna do this work alone. Um, uh, so the first topic was what is post-traumatic stress? The second was safety and self-care. Um, and then it kind of went on from there. Um, and so we'd read a paragraph and then people would talk about, and they were in the first stage group, they, they didn't go into a lot of detail about what happened to them. Um, they bonded more about their symptoms um, and, um, and how to take it, you know, and, and how they were coping and developing coping strategies. But people, I mean, what we found was group members had a lot more empathy for one another than they had for themselves. You know, they often share, you know, the shame and self-blame, but they didn't feel that way about the other group members. They felt that kind of um, righteous indignation about the other group members, you know. Um, and so it, bega it became a kind of an alternative moral community where people didn't feel so isolated and ostracized. Um, and then in our second stage group, people got into much more telling the trauma story, um, but we didn't just do that for its own sake. Um, one, we, we asked people to, each individual to think of a, a goal. These were usually 16 week groups um, that was related to the trauma and that that would be too hard to do alone, but that they thought maybe they could accomplish if they had other people had their back, you know, and because uh, and we wanted them to have a, an experience of agency and mastery. And by the time they finished the group, you know, they would have, uh, so they used the group, the early meetings of the group to explain, you know, talk about what happened to them and ex develop their goals. And then the later uh, group sessions, uh, people, um, you know, would come back and say, you know, I, I did it. You know, I, I, I told my sister, you know, I told my mother, um, uh, I told my husband, I mean, you would, well, you probably wouldn't be surprised how few people um, had told anyone. Um, and um, and <clears throat> some people had in-group goals, like I want to tell part of my story and stay in my body, not dissociate, you know. Um, and we wanted them to be achievable goals um, within the time frame of the group. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of people had disclosure goals, and if that was the goal, then we helped them prepare. You know, well, and to ask for what they wanted, but also to be prepared if they didn't get it. So, you know, if they told their mother what happened, what if she doesn't believe you? Are you do still want to go ahead with it? And, you know, if they said, well, then I'd be devastated. And, you know, then you, I think maybe that the time isn't right. Uh, but if they said, well, then, you know what? 
that's her problem. You know, I'm not keeping the family secret anymore. Um, then we would say, go for it, you know, and plan it carefully, plan exactly when and where and how you're going to do it, have your support system all in place. Um, and those were incredibly powerful. Um, uh, I mean, people came back and, just, you know, if they got support, they were glowing. But even if they didn't, they just felt proud of themselves. And sort of like, well, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, gonna, you know, I, I'm not going to uh, be part of the conspiracy of silence anymore. And so um, I do think that, you know, it, it, it's like an alternative court, if you will, <laughs> to bring people together in that way. Thank you. That was helpful. I can't see a hand raised, so please, if there are more questions from the audience, just feel free to unmute your microphone and speak up. Not for the moment. I would then have a question. During your work with women, when this period passes, well, I can't say a period needed or required, but yeah, after this 10 week or 16 week period, have you worked with women uh, giving them support to actually report the violence they experienced to the police personally or, or to press charges? Um, or to, to go to the prosecutor's office to... For... Um, I think that was personally You support them. Well, we did have victim advocates attached to our mm -hmm. program. Um, and they were there to, they were social workers, um, are social workers, um, um, and they were there basically to help victims, uh, if definitely to help victims if they want, decided they wanted to go forward with reporting to the police, then the advocates, or go to court, the, yes, the advocates would accompany them. Um, and um, they would also do th other things that victims needed in a crisis. Uh, for example, if they needed to uh, uh, not only get a, a restraining order with domestic violence, not only help them get a restraining order, for example, from the court, but also to get housing and food and <laughs> Um, you know, whatever they needed to be able to create a safe home for themselves and their kids. So yeah, it was a, a multi-service um, component that we had because no, you're right, therapy by itself isn't going to, um, uh, it isn't going to be, it's necessary, but not sufficient for many survivors. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have one quick question. <laughs> um, I really like this idea of financial restitu restitution mm -hmm. for abusers. Um, we live in a very patriarchal world still and gender-based violence is still not really taken seriously. Um, in many countries, my own as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this would be a very powerful way uh, to force accountability. I mean, we've started doing it on 
sugar taxes and so forth. I just want to know more about this idea of taxing or financial restitution from abusers. How did it work? How was it perceived? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, the way it, it I, I mean, one of the very nice things about it is that it, it, it means that survivors can access funds whether or not the particular perpetrator has any money, you know. Uh, but the, the money is collected by the court um, when they place a fine on the offender. And that, you know, we have a, a federal government that collects fines for federal crimes, and then states collect money for state crimes. Um, and the money goes into a um, a trust fund. And then the other nice progressive thing about it is that survivors sit on the board that allocates the funds. So, you know, for example, with, with our Victims of Violence program, we would submit proposals to the board. Uh, in fact, our Victim Advocacy Service was supported by um, uh, these, these Volk of Victims of Crime Act funds. Um, and we also had a homicide bereavement service that was free um, and that involved going out into the community and that was funded by Victims of Crime Act. But, but the, the board of directors that, um, uh, reviews proposals and allocates the funds included representatives of survivors. So, um, uh, yeah, and it was it, it was based on grant funding. Uh, you know, generally, uh, funding would be granted for a period of three to five years, and you know, then uh, that kind of thing. But but it, it has been very successful in terms of, I mean, I think it now supports a lot of the first line crisis centers around the country. Um, and, and were politicians in the community quite pro it or was it? Well, they were because it was, it was marketed as, as um, a law and order. Um, I mean, it was actually um, started during the regime of Ronald Reagan, who was um, a very, you know, right-wing uh, politician. But, you know, it was part of being tough on crime. Um, so it was marketed that way, and that turned out to work very well. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for your good questions. I guess if there are no other questions, it's time to wrap up. So thank you all for your attention. And uh, well, I did it. Uh, thank you so much, Judith, for uh, this evening and for everything that you have shared with us. Some of these things that we have heard were fact checking. We were checking also if we were on track. Uh -huh. uh, Hvala svima, lijep pozdrav.
I hvala prevoditeljkama i ženskoj sobi koja je omogućila da se ovo vidi kako treba. Pozdrav za sve. Hvala, pozdrav svima i čuvajte se. Takođe, čao. Pozdrav. Ok, evo snimanje prestilo. Sjajno je bilo, Ljiljo, stvarno svaka čast što ste dobro. A to sad gotovo je? Gotovo je. Ajde nešto priča. Gotovo ne stvarno. Hvala, pozdrav svima. Ćao, ćao, pozdrav. Dobro, ok. Super je bilo, kako si ti zadovoljna? Ja, jesam, mislim, mislim da je bilo ok. Ja, kad je ona u pitanju, tu sam potpuno nemam, ja samo mogu da je... Ja imam toliko neku razinu poštovanja. Ovo vam sam, znaš, onako, ne možeš džudit postaviti pitanje. Možeš samo buljit u nju ko budala. Žeći, ja koja inače mogu pričati za uvijek, e, u nju samo gledam ko u Bogu. A vidim da si, da imaš ja isto ko... Ja ono gledam ju s osmihom i mislim si ono, čuviš, džudit priča. Znaš, onako, nema više ko to što... Da, sad snima mi, mislim, to je to. Znaš, i ove sad mlade cure, ok, postave one neka pitanja i vidiš da... Znaš, ono i trude se, ono i strela. Ja bi samo nju slušala, šta ona ima. Tako je, potpuno otvorena. Ja sam mislila u jednom momentu da jedino što ja mogu reći, da sam ono toliko overwhelmed, toliko preplavljena tim što nju slušam, da nemam jedno pitanje da mogu samo zahvaliti. Onda se mislim zvučiću ko neka tuka. Ja, dobro reći. Baš mi došlo, ono koji samo buljim u nju i kao... Jeste, ja mislim da su sve... Žene zadovoljne, zadovoljne time što su bile 